Let's switch into the fixed income space for you. Stephen Nash from Fig Securities. With me in studio, uh, Stephen, of course, all eyes were on CPI yesterday. The dollar took a hit. How did our fixed income markets respond? Well, uh, three-year bonds rallied about five basis points. You might remember earlier in the week we had the PPI numbers and they, mm. they rose as a result of those higher than expected numbers. Um, and the market has now revised down the, the prospect of, of a tightening. But I don't think it's a really easy decision for the RBA. I think everyone's saying, oh, it's a lay down this area. They're definitely not going to go. I think the RBA still has a lingering concern about capacity. That They've expressed that uh, quite a bit. Mm. I think the thing that may uh, be entering some of the minds at the moment would be the concern on how the currency, how the Chinese currency will affect Chinese growth going forward. Mm. Okay, hasn't had much effect yeah. so far. The US are being more aggressive there, and I imagine that the, the rise in the Chinese currency may accelerate somewhat uh, fairly soon, and that will have an effect on Chinese growth. If anything, would that not further delay business, business investment spending? This is, this is shown in the quarter to be softer than expected. A large part of that's due to uncertainty over taxation. Yes. It's seen those businesses just holding back. Now, if, as you say, if that plays out, doesn't that indeed help us out a little bit more? It just keeps those inflationary pressures, which I believe contribute about 25% of growth for the mining debt yeah, overall yeah. to GDP, just at an acceptable level. It, 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 it contains that, that growth. I think the concern mm. is about above trend growth. Mm. Now, if, if uh, investment is constrained, well, we won't get that growth and, and that won't be realised in 2011-12. Mm. So that can delay uh, the tightenings. As you know, the tightening it, is a very blunt instrument. It, it tends to affect uh, people that it's not intended to affect and does, it doesn't really affect the mining sector. So it's probably better that, it, that it's not uh, raised at this stage. It's very interesting that there have been some notes of caution sounded about previous unexpected booms yeah. where there was almost a, an air of complacency. You go back to uh, 06, 07, underlying inflation yeah. uh, was printing unexpectedly at half of 1% and, uh, for two quarters mm. and then it just ran roughshod for 12 months right yeah. up to four and a half. Yes, that, that's a precedent I think the, uh, the RBA is very aware of but I think the context is a little bit different now. We're just about to get uh, the QE2 uh, details. Um, we've been waiting for months for this particular event. I think the market, there's a lot of pricing built into the market. I think the, the risk trade may, as you say, come off. Equities may adjust. Uh, I think the market reaction to that is really going to be an important uh, point for the RBA to look at. Mm. Um, in addition, I think the, the event of QE2 really indicates how, how difficult the situation is in the US. That wasn't the case back then. Mm. That's the case now. So I think going forward, the out outlook is for lower growth for longer. What is, it, what is it actually of greatest concern, do you believe? Is it simply whether that money finds its way to the right home, and that's not known for some time? Mm. Or is it what's going on in Europe, where real spreads are blowing out between those nation states that have mm. got their houses in order, Germany mm. and everyone else, the peripherals, yeah. it's only widening and suggesting that actually the battle to, to, to right that ship of debt is perhaps a bigger threat than just where the jobs will tick up in the US. Yeah, but this is another uh, problem that we had earlier in the year. It just keeps on coming back. We keep yeah. on trying to forget about it and it keeps on coming back on the agenda. I think uh, the most important uh, area in, in the European situation is probably the Irish situation. Mm -hmm. And not Greece. No, not I don't think so. I think that the plan that the Irish will be coming out with in November is going to be very important. There may be a possibility of a multi-notch downgrade for that particular country. Mm. We have seen the UK come out with a very austere budget and the, the rating agencies have now taken their rating back to uh, neutral from negative. I think that's a very positive thing for the UK. So it's, I suppose that's a precedent for other European countries to follow. Well, and yet they're so different in their mind shift. Yep. And we don't need to get bogged down by that. But I mean, the medicine can be, I guess, taken and uh, gulped down by the Brits. And they're still spending. You look at that growth print you yeah, know, for yeah. the quarter. They defied everyone's projections. But mm. in Greece, they're not taking their medicine. And the polys are doing quite what they shouldn't be doing, which is responding to those protests, not defying them. Well, and that's why the IMF and the EU will say, well, you don't meet your Q3 turnaround, forget any loans. Yeah, well, it's easy for us to say that in, in, in the context of being so far away. I mean, you're on, on the ground there, you've got people very angry. You can understand their, their frustrations. Um, 
I think they've, it's, it's like any other political story. They have to direct those angers away from um, what right. policy is doing now onto other issues. It's a cha it's, in, a, in a sense, it's a way of channeling those frustrations. Yeah. Mm. But would you say it's not balance? That was what I was trying to get at. Those simmering issues, as they percolate to the surface, do they present more of an issue for the global economy right now than the US failure to bring about creation through QE2, mm. therefore market malaise well, it, and domino effects to Asia? I think it's a similar problem. Growth in both mm. Europe and the US is very low. Let's, let's face the fact, the developed world has a very low level of growth. And um, I think that's what, what the developed world is trying to do is stimulate that growth. And they're looking for other policy tools. And one is currency. I think currency going forward is going to be used more aggressively. And the tension between emerging markets and the developed world, I think, has to be addressed at some, at some stage. So there has to be some sharing of the pain between the developed world and the emerging markets. Yeah. I don't think there's enough of that at this stage. All right. Uh, let's just look inside some of those issues that are... Uh, affecting the US as well as that decision gets made into next week mm. by the Fed. It's going to be looking at housing and that Case Shiller index as well. Mm. Uh, that certainly isn't showing a runaway rescue story. It's no. showing maybe stabilization if you can go that far. Yeah, the, the, mm. the producers of the index are, uh, you know, their comment was that they were disappointed that the, the index couldn't uh, stage any rise, mm. it, effectively stabilizing at lower levels. This is all indicating a lack of confidence in, in, in consumer behaviour in the US. What the, what the authorities have to do is inspire that conf, uh, confidence, and that's just not there right now. So I suppose that underlies the, the, the idea of lower growth for longer. If uh, we, we can get some traction going in terms of growth, mm. that will improve, but it's, but it's just not there right now. Right. And your doubt whether QE2 could bring that about? Um, depends on the size of it. Yeah. Obviously, there's been some talk that it's going to be low, uh, smaller than market expected. I think market expectations have really got out of yeah. they've got out of all reality. They've gone completely, become unreal in a, in a lot of ways. So, you know, the idea of a smaller uh, QE2 is probably more realistic. It really depends on what extra is in in the statement, whether or not there'll be further uh, easings down the track. I think that will be important for the market. Tell me about an interesting bond issue that Goldman Sachs embarked on and, and who was targeted, mm. the uptake, mm. and what is that telling you about investor appetite for risky assets versus you know, safe harbours? Well, um, I, I think uh, the Goldman issue initially was sized at around $250 million, came out at $1.3 billion, was targeted at the retail investor with small lots of $25, 52 million units of $25, mm. uh, came in at the lower end of the range indicating a very large demand by the retail sector for high-yielding bonds, or high-yielding bonds. A 50-year bond, callable in five years, apparently would have been priced much, you know, the deal would have been higher to institutional investors. Mm. Some have said, well, this is a sucker bond and, um, you know, the retail market's getting uh, sucked in because Goldman's coming out just before QE2, it's, it's really bad timing for them. Mm. And you know, people have been saying the retail market's got it wrong for the last th three or four months. I don't think they really have. They've been looking at rates coming off, they've been worried about growth, and I think in the new normal bonds may play a much bigger role in asset allocation, so that we, we have a lower growth uh, environment, bonds tend to dominate asset allocation now going why forward. Now why could our banks not do the same thing and actually issue a bond and then really be on the global stage when it comes to lending to some of the big corporates in Australia who are going to offshore bond markets well, instead? The, the local banks are doing what they can in terms of funding. They find that they're quite constrained in the, in the local market in terms of asset allocation. If mm. allocation of fixed income can, can increase, then they can, they can buy more bonds. Um, a longer bond would be, would be very good for a lot of the banks in terms of lengthening their, their debt profile, but the, the market really isn't Just not there. It's not there at the moment. Right. We need to work on that and develop that longer part of the, the mm. bond market, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, but in the meanwhile, you know, these other, these other big beasts do just cement their position because it's such a more sophisticated market. Well, I imagine there, there may be other banks that look to do long issues because the, it lengthens the debt uh, mm. profile and takes the pressure off short-term funding. So I imagine that uh, others will follow this retail issue and tap that, that innate demand in the U.S. market. Because as a 50-year, we've, we've heard, what, well, there's been an instance of, of even a 100-year issue. Well, Goldman's led a 100-year issue yeah. for the Mexican uh, government just before that, before that. They found a lot of interest. Right. 
And uh, yeah, there's been quite a few longer issues. Um, people say, well, 100 year bonds, it's just way too long. But they're prepared to buy equities, which are perpetual investments. Mm, yeah. They don't think about the time when they oh. buy the equity, but when they buy the bond, they think about, oh, it's a, it's a long bond. Indeed. Stephen, uh, listen, we will probably see the other side of that Reserve Bank decision, so there'll be lots to mull when we have you back. Many thanks for Thank that. Thank you. Appreciate it.